Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Jones, and I am so excited to have you here with us today because we have a very interesting topic. Today, we're talking about the link between the food we eat and our mental health. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait to hear all of the information that Dr. Malo has for us today. So thank you for being here, Dr. Malo. It's a pleasure to have you with us. We are so excited. And I will also like to introduce Amy Hannes. She is here and she's going to do all the technical side for us today. So Amy, do you wanna walk us through some of the issues that might come up? Sure, absolutely. We love technology when it works perfectly, but that does not always happen. So um, just know that if we pop off, give us a second to pop back on. Um, if there's any technical difficulties, just be patient with us. We have found, so if you have issues, we have found that the Chrome browser works very well. So if you have any issues hearing us or seeing us, um, that can be a great browser that um, you can connect to using that um, to help you there. We will have a recording of this, so if you just cannot seem to get it to work, that's A-OK. -okay. We will be sharing a recording of this workshop with you in your next member email, as well as in your uh, Full Plate Living membership. One of the things, and I see many, many of you have already found it, is the chat. So just find the chat feature, say hi, tell us where you're joining from. Um, what's cool is that we're all three in different states as yes. well. So um, that's what's wonderful about, about technology is bring us all together to share on a wonderful topic that Dr. Merlot is going to share with us today. Um, so I think that is it. If you have questions, the chat area is where you're going to ask those questions. At the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for some Q&A um, to go through as many of those as we can. So um, welcome, and I cannot wait to hear this whole entire workshop. Yeah, that makes two of us. And one uh, quick reminder that you can always refresh your browser if you start losing sound or have any issues like that. So Dr. Merlot, uh, Dr. Gia Merlot practices adult psychiatry at NYU Langone Health. And Dr. Mello is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, clinical professor of nursing, and senior advisor on wellness at NYU's Rory Myers College of Nursing, and the chair of the Mental Health and Behavioral Health MIG within the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And we are just thrilled that you have taken the time to be with us here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amy, for inviting me and Michelle. This is amazing. I'm so glad to be here and I'm very honored to be able to present this topic. And, and I want to leave enough time in the end for the questions and answers because I think that's really important in this process. So it might, I may go a little quickly, but you can always circle back and ask those questions in the chat if you want to. And I think this will be recorded so it'll be available for everyone later as well. So here we go. It's going to go quickly, but trust me, it's a story and we're going to get to a place when we're, then we're, we're all going to say, I hope that we have an aha moment in this. So just as a disclosure, I do receive royalties for two of my books, um, one for Oxford University Press, uh, their textbooks, and another for Lifestyle Nursing as a textbook. I have two more textbooks coming out this year from the same presses. One is Lifestyle Psychiatry, and the other one is a more uh, advanced version of the Medical Professionalism book with Oxford University Press. So when we talk about the field of psychiatry, it's a medical field. I am a physician. I went to medical school. And we think about where we have come and where we are going, because the point we are in in 2023 is not where we've been. And I don't think it's where we're going. So back in the olden days, in the 1700s and the 1800s, we were locking people up and chaining them if they had psychiatric disorders. Then we started understanding that talk therapy was helpful. We were putting everybody on the and the couch with psychoanalysis it's still useful but what then we started understanding about the brain we started doing brain scanning then we started really focusing on wait wait what's going on is there is it all chemical is it all medication based but i think where we're headed where we're really headed is those last five bullet points on the slide it's artificial intelligence and how that's going to affect what we do virtual reality and brain stimulation, neurotechnology, and what I'm gonna be really focusing about today is the gut-brain axis, and I think this could potentially change everything that we understand from, from now onward. And it's exciting because 
what we what I'm going to talk about today is we individually and collectively as a group of people that are concerned about food and what we put in our bodies, we have a lot more control than we think about some aspects of our mental health. So as I just said, we're going to talk about the gun-brain axis. We're going to talk about the gut microbiome. Then I'm going to go on, and I'm going to try to break this down and make it as simple as possible. Don't get scared by some of these slides that are very technical, but I'm putting them up there just in case there are people in the audience that already know a lot of this information so that you can also look at it and learn um, uh, from that as well. So let's, let's ground ourselves in the meanings of the words. So usually we use these words differently. I just want to say what I tend to think about these words. When I think about well-being, I think it's a state of happiness, good physical and mental health, good quality of life. And in well-being, I think we need to have good mental health, which is like not having those just diagnoses and those symptoms along with it. We need to have good brain health, which means that we need to be able to think clearly. And it's from when we're younger, because I've seen patients that are two years old. I'm a child and adult psychiatrist, as far as people when they're older, in their 80s and 90s and beyond. So we need good brain health through that. And wellness is just having a good quality of life and a sense of well-being. So well-being actually encompasses all of that. And the way I like to think of it, the most efficient way for me to think about it is that we all want wellness, which is a good quality of life and a sense of well-being. And then if we go further out, mental health includes wellness and also free of symptoms of mental illness. And when we talk about brain health, that's with all of it. And I think that when I talk about myself and how I identify myself, is that I, I think that analogous to you know cardiologists, their, their organ that they work with is the heart. You know, the liver specialists work with livers. The kidney specialists work with the kidneys. And the psychiatrist, me, I work with the brain. There's no organ called mental. So I actually think that going forward, I would love to see that psychiatrists can be understood to be working with the brain because everything that we do, our diet, our exercise, and all these different variables, they actually go and affect the brain. And I hope with this presentation, I will make you believe that as well. So we could have good mental health or poor mental health. And this is really important to understand because people with severe mental illnesses, like we call them the severe mental illnesses, the chronic ones, they can have good mental health if they're adequately treated. And they can also have poor mental health, but at the same time, someone that has no diagnosis of a mental illness could have good mental health or poor mental health. So what's really important is what you do with it and how you treat it or prevent it. And sometimes even reverse some of these disorders by good interventions in lifestyle. So when we talk about lifestyle psychiatry, Really, it's similar to the same six pillars that we talk about lifestyle medicine. We need to understand that these are the things that we can do as individuals, as consumers, as patients, as clients, that can partner with what the physician or our providers are doing. We have control over what we put into our body as far as nutrition. We can choose to exercise or not. We can abstain from substance use. We can have healthy relationships, decrease our stress, and improve our sleep. When I see patients, usually I say, I do this in reverse order, actually. The first thing I tend to do with patients is say, how are you sleeping? Because we really, as a society, really don't seem to stress enough that if we're not having our seven to nine hours as an adult of sleep per night, we're not going to be functioning very well in any way. And you know what? If we don't do that for enough days, we're going to seem a little disjointed. So we really need to start with the sleep and then talk about our stress. We talk about our relationships. We talk Talk about trying to decrease what we're doing uh, and putting into our body that's not good for itself, leading to exercise. And sometimes I don't even call it exercise, I call it movement. How can you increase your movement? You know, I have some patients that may be wheelchair bound. Yes, you can just do it when you've been in the wheelchair. It doesn't have to be exercise. It can be movement of any sort and of course, nutrition. So the American Heart Association recently revised what they call their Life's Essential Eight. And before they had, you know, they're, they're actually seven, and they added in there 
what I think is like a big win for mental health and brain health, because they said that you can't have healthy heart health because American Heart Association is saying this and they're a very reputable organization. You cannot have a happy, uh, healthy heart health without also having healthy mental health. You have to control and understand these things in order for your heart. Because what they say is if you have poor mental health, and those are the, the ways that they're talking about it, then your heart can also be uh, impaired and the other way around. So the fact that they acknowledge this and then they actually are talking about it in a global scale is really important. Brain health, mental health, stress, anxiety, it's not only for our mental health, it actually affects our body's physical health and our heart health. So in that thought, I prefer to think of mental health, our brain health, in the middle of all these pillars of lifestyle medicine because it affects each and every one of them. And I want to try to help you understand today in the best way possible how you can control and you can have more power in your own mental health. So if you look at the left side of this uh, figure, it's a lot of words, but I really just want to focus on the left side first. And that left column talks about these lifestyle factors that may not be healthy, unhealthy diet, not moving around a lot, having a lot of stress, you know, you're taking a lot of medications, poor sleep, socially isolated, that you don't really have people that are supporting you. If you have those things happening in your life, and then go to the column all the way to the right, and those are the disorders that can happen in our body. Obesity, type two, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, depression, which is a mental health disorder, and other diseases. The middle two columns are what happens in our body. So how do we get from these unhealthy lifestyles to these disorders? And the middle two is what's happening in our body. And there are two points on the bottom you can see where we can do lifestyle interventions. We can do it as soon as these, these, these lifestyle problems happen and thereby stop the, 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 the microbiome becoming abnormal or those changes in our DNA or cellular stress. Or if those already happen, then we can do lifestyle interventions before we get inflammation on our bodies. Because the common pathway for all these disorders and all these things happening in our body is inflammation. And inflammation is a big part of what happens in the formation of these diseases. So before I go into the gut microbiome, because I think that's really important and that's where all the really exciting research is coming, I just wanted to highlight this little busy slide, but just point out that of the psychiatric patients that we see showing inflammation, 25% um, of them show information, inflammation. That's a huge number. So if we're saying in one in four of our psychiatric patients have inflammation, then we're saying that these interventions could potentially help them. That's a huge, huge number. Millions and millions of people. Oxidative stress, mitochondrial dysfunction, that's especially important with schizophrenic patients and our other chronically uh, mentally ill patients that we're seeing you know, gut microbiota, which I'll talk about. And then the last couple are just epigenetics, things that change our genes ability to function and what happens in our brain with the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So what does it mean? So this is where I wanna just give you a little grounding on some of these words. It doesn't really matter. We can call it microbiome or microbiota. For those of you that really want to understand the science, microbiota is really about the microorganisms that are in our gut and other parts of our body. The microbiome is actually the genetic material. It tends to be said in different ways and both of those are being used in the media, that's fine. If you see microbiome or microbiota, it's kind of talking about the same thing. So when we talk about this, what we, what we have is if it's abnormal and it's not functioning well, we call it dysbiosis. And that could be from everything we've talked about already, but antibiotics are also a big part of that. And then we want to make it back to normal. That's what we call homeostasis. And that could be with the dietary fiber, resistant starch, probiotics, and lifestyle. So we're going to talk through those a little bit and why. I want to arm you with the science of why so that the naysayers in the room that say, this doesn't make any sense, Dr. Merlot, I'm going to try to give you some of the science behind it so that you can hopefully start making these changes for your life as well and your loved ones. So 
we know that there are millions and potentially billions of genes in our gut microbiome, and we only have 25,000 in our own genetic makeup in our as humans. So there's so many more of these genes in my, our microbiome. So if you take a step back from this for a second, the microbiome is are these little organisms that we have in every human inside of our body in our gut. And the reason it's really important is because these are what allow us to live. If we lost all our microbiome and tried to get rid of these and say, oh my gosh, we've got bugs in our gut, we gotta get rid of them, we would all die. We need them. So for those of you that like to do gratitude and do gratitude journaling at night, I would hope that you could just say a thanks tonight for these microbiome because with that, without them, we would all not be making it. So we should feel a lot of gratitude because they are the ones that digest our food. So without them, we won't be able to digest our food. And the most important point of all this is the gut microbiome needs one type of food to, to be able to survive and help us be healthy, and that's fiber. They need the short chain fatty acids from the fiber. So fiber is what they're, they're seeking and they're craving. And the only way we get fiber in our diet, the only way we get fiber in our diet is from whole food plant-based. There are no animal proteins, no meats that give us any fiber. We must get it from plants and plant-based foods. So I want to stop again because I've been talking about gut and we're going to continue to talk about gut. But for you know, this is from a, a medical textbook that uh, medical students are reading. So this is not something that's new and I'm just saying it. It's established in what we know that there are microbiota and these microbiomes in all parts of our body. Why is that relevant and important? Because as we're doing the research, we're realizing that there's so many pieces that have microbiome. Our hair has a microbiome. You know, even MD Anderson is doing really amazing research. It's the number one cancer center in the world in Houston, Texas. And they have found out that even tumor cells, even the cancer cells that we have in our body have a microbiome. And what they, one of these research studies that I read recently is that these tumor cells that are malignant and cancer, they have a microbiome and they did research and they found out that if you actually try to treat that cancer, depending upon if you have a good microbiome or not a healthy microbiome, you could, it's different on how the cancer responds to the treatment. So it's actually really important information and that could be very important for us even for cancer, for cancer improving from cancer. So if we go back to the gut microbiome and think about it, depending upon if you have a plant-based diet, Mediterranean diet or Western diet, you're gonna see that our gut has different actual compositions of these little organisms in our back in, in our gut. And that legend there in the middle, that's really actually the different types of the organisms in our gut. And you see it's different if you're on a plant-based diet, a Western diet. And the Western diet is a standard American diet, meaning a lot of ultra processed foods and, and things that are not food, but are food products, okay? So that's kind of what we're talking about. And I can't tell you exactly what all of this means, but we know that it's different. And we know for a fact that Bacteroides, which is really high in the plant-based diet, is absolutely the good one. So we want to increase that and try to eat as many plants as we can so that we can uh, nourish our, um, feed our microbiota actually, that nourishes our body. So what else is important about the composition of our microbiome? So we know from the many, many research studies going on right now that even, I mentioned stress and exercise, but even the way that you're born will affect your gut microbiome. There's some studies that say that we have a certain type of gut microbiome and we get it from being born um, in and, and through labor that we get it from our mothers when we're birthed. Then, and then there's other studies that say, well, even if you have a C-section, you will still get it from your mothers because you get it from their skin microbiota, which we know exists as well. But the interesting stuff, and I've talked to you about diet, I talked to you about medications, it'll get rid of it. So that's really important to try to replenish your gut if you take antibiotics. But the other thing that's really fascinating in this is pet ownership. So one thing we do know is that we want a big, 
wide diversity. We want different types of, of these organisms in our gut. We just don't want them all to be the same. So when we have pets that actually, because they kind of go commingle a little bit and we, and we get some of the microbiomes from our, our animals, that that actually in effect helps us as well. So that's good news. That's very good news. And of course, genetics pay some part in it. We don't want to undermine that as well. So these are some of the diseases from all these studies that I put on the bottom that's been uh, pretty clear that are associated with problems in our gut microbiota. And I'm gonna focus mostly on the ones in the right side on the top, which are the psychiatric and mood disorders. And um, we're, gonna we're gonna walk through these a little bit today. So where is the science? So this is a study that came out in 2022 and there've been multiple studies, but just to give you a flavor of what's going on. So we know that it's not just one thing. It's not just these, these, micro, these, these, these microbiome and all these organisms in our gut. How is it digesting? How is it affecting our brain? Well, we know that the brain and the gut actually through when we're when we're in utero and we're fetuses and we're, as we're developing they come from the same part it's called a neural crest when they're born and when we're developing but what we know is through that what has evolved is we have a pathway straight from our gut to the brain through the vagus nerve we have a path through the the endocrine system we have a path through the immune system that goes through our blood and we have a path through the gut barrier, you know, where the gut and, and where our food is inside of our gut and in and to the inside of our gut. And we have some that they go through there and they talk about leaky gut a lot. I don't know if you've heard about that in the literature, but there's so many ways that these gut microbiome is a, are affecting what's going on in the brain. It goes directly up to the brain and it's really mostly dependent upon the food that we eat. So most of you may have heard of serotonin and serotonin, we talk a lot about that when we talk about the most common um, class of medications prescribed for depression and that those are all affect the serotonin at some level, they're called the SSRIs. So when I went to medical school about 30 years ago, I didn't really understand where serotonin was coming from. I knew that it was stored in this part of the brain called the raphine nucleus. But what we realize now is that 95% of our body serotonin is actually produced. It's made in the gut. And what that means to me is that if you don't feed those gut microbiome, the, 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 the components they need to be able to produce the serotonin, you may not have enough serotonin in your body. And we know that because tryptophan is one of those components that is needed to produce serotonin, and that needs to come from our diet. And that comes from our plant-based foods that we eat, and they get synthesized, they get produced within the the different cells within the gut, the little little cells within the gut. And there's been a lot of studies that found that if we don't have these components and we don't eat a fiber rich food and diet, then at times in some of these studies, 50% of the serotonin is only 50%, half of it is available for circulation and to go up to our brain. So just think about it. If we could only have, if we only have half of the serotonin ne needed that we need in our body, how that can have impact sleep, appetite, pain, and mood, which is really what's, it's crucial for those things, serotonin. So one of the main things that I just want to touch upon is that this concept I already mentioned of ultra processed foods. So process, uh, foods are, are divided by a NOVA classification into three or four types of foods. So there's regular food. Those are the whole foods that we eat. They're the fruits and the vegetables in the way that they've been created. And then there's the minimally processed foods that we put things in them um, to make them last longer in cans, or other things, there's salts and, and sugars that are added. And ultra processed foods are actually even cut down even further. They're broken down into components. And I would argue that they're not actually foods, they're called food products. They're not healthy for us. They're not um, nutritive for us, but it, they're convenience. And I understand over time of the last few decades, we've moved towards more of these things. Those are the things in packets that you eat. And those we call food products and they're ultra processed foods. And and they're really highly linked to depression. 
So this is a study that shows if you just look at this, if you look at that number on the top between males and females, that we have about 50 to 60% of our diet right now of the things we put in our mouth are these ultra processed foods. And this is exponentially so much more than it was 40, 50 years ago when we were eating more healthy foods and not uh, relying on these packaged foods all the time. And what you will see here, the minimally processed foods, about 30%, and uh, the processed culinary ingredients are somewhat lower, and the processed foods are in between. What's really important here is not only how much we're doing, but the upticks. It keeps going higher. This is a graph from 2001 to 2018, but you see the trend is higher, and the minimally processed foods we're eating less and less of, and that's really what we need to be eating. And if we break it down even within races, in this study it shows that our Hispanic uh, colleagues are doing um, much better. It's 50%, but still 50%. And again, you see that the trend is higher, that we're just eating more and more processed foods in this country. So what happens with these processed foods and when we go into our, our body? So like I said before, these ultra processed foods, even if they're made from things that sound like real foods, like ketchup is made from tomatoes. Even though it's made from that, when they process it, they remove all the fibers. And, and the fiber, I told you before, is what our gut microbiota need to be able to survive, and, and that's their food. And so if they need that through the short chain amino acids in our fibers, they need that to keep healthy. And this is what I have here is a little, uh, just shows you what happens. And if you just go to the end, all the way to the right-hand side, what that means is through this process that goes on in our body, it protects our brain. It protects neuroprotection of our brain through multiple different pathways that I had mentioned before as well. There's neuroplasticity, the oxidative stress, and um, you know catecholamine, uh, catecholamine synthesis. If we don't have the dietary fiber, we're not going to get the neuroprotection, and we're going to have a decrease in the serotonin and and the uh, catecholamines in our brain. And this is a travesty. Ultra processed foods contain sugars, salts, and oils. If you take any package that you see and you look at the back and you look at all these things that you don't know how to pronounce, that's ultra processed foods, okay? And therefore, you'll see a change in your gut bacteria and, and they have no fiber. So they don't feed your, your microbiome and they starve. And they starve and they cause illnesses within our bodies. So just going back to the science again one more time, this is an amazing study that came out in 2020 that really, uh, that talked about the evidence of how we can prevent and treat, treat mental illness with lifestyle factors. I just put it up there to show that there's some factors that are highly grounded in the, in, the, in the research, and there's some that are less grounded. So if you look at the upper left-hand side, that's supposed to be food. So we know that it affects depression, but we have data also with ADHD, and we have lots, hundreds and hundreds of studies going on right now that are NIH sponsored that are showing and potentially will show other causes and other ways of uh, how it could be preventative and treatment. What is also important here is exercise, smoking, stopping it, and sleep. And what I want to just say is exercise is not only good because of the exercise and how it helps your heart, but exercise also helps your gut microbiome and it helps um, in, in the other ways to produce uh, what you want in your mental health that way. So again, this is a, just want to get back to this and we're going to be focusing on the upper right, the psychiatric disorders. And though I want to say that they are all connected and we call it bi-directional, meaning that if you have heart problems, you can see more mental health issues. If you have mental health issues, you can have more heart problems. And it's not just cardiovascular and heart problems, it's with all these disorders. And we call that bi-directional. And that's been shown to be true within the, the, the research that we've done to date. So this is one study that I just want to highlight because it goes, it shows you how interesting and how 
creative some of these researchers are in showing this connection. For the people in the room that still don't believe me, I hope this study will help you. So what they did is they took depressed patients. They knew they were depressed. They looked at their inflammatory, what they had in their, in their blood. They looked at their cortisol levels and they looked at their microbiome and they looked at it with how much, how good, good stuff they have in it and the diversity. Then they took healthy controls that did not have any signs of depression, no clinical depression, and did not have these markers. Then they took rats and they, they got rid of all their microbiome. They just took it all out, okay? And then they took the, the poop, I'm sorry, I'm using technical terms here today, but this is a fecal microbiota transplant, which is the poop, and they took it from these uh, depressed patients and they took it from these healthy patients and they put them in the rats. And what they found is the rats that took, got the poop from the depressed patients started having symptoms of depression. They started having, they started not feeling happy. They were not feeling interest or pleasure in things. They started having increased anxiety and they started having these uh, blood levels of things that show that they have depression and infl inflammation. And the rats that got poop from healthy controls did not show up any of these. Fascinating, fascinating research. So what are the mental disorders that are most common in the US? Those are on the left-hand side, the anxiety, depression, ADHD, bipolar disorder, eating disorders, substance use disorders, dementia and Alzheimer, and the most impacted by diet. Aha, guess what? They're the same they are the same. So if you if you could believe that anxiety and depression together are the most burdensome, the most number of people struggling with this of any disorder in the world, that means that we could impact these with diet the most. We could actually impact them. Very exciting stuff. Can you tell I'm really excited about this? Okay, so here we go. The next so let's go through this. I'm not going to go in detail, but I want to sh I want you to look at the patterns. So these are studies that may be one study or five studies. It's not a lot of studies. You remember that graph I said in the beginning, but because we know that there's some studies, I'm putting it out there because these are things that usually will not hurt you. They could help you. Okay. So if you look at fermented foods, you look at nuts, turmeric, we have saffron, lavender, passion fruit, omega-3s, quinoa. These foods have been seen in different studies to help with depression. Foods that may worsen depression. Look at, look at this. We have these sugary foods. We have um, high fat, animal fat, margarine, fried foods, white bread, processed meats, these um, sugar substitutes. Foods that may help with anxiety. Again, you're seeing the same sort of things. Green leafy vegetables, we're seeing lavender, grains, uh, turmeric, fermented foods. Foods that can worsen anxiety, aha. Processed, ultra processed foods. And then we have alcohol there. And look there on the bottom left. We have um, caffeinated food uh, beverages, and that could worsen anxiety. But if you look at the next one, they may help with ADHD. So it's important to understand that it may help in one and worsen the other. So I tend to say with patients that I have that have ADHD and anxiety, just avoid the caffeine if you can or minimize it. So it can worsen ADHD. Berries are amazing with ADHD. Um, uh, eggplant, green tea, onions, uh, green leafy vegetables. Wor foods that may worsen ADHD. Again, you're seeing dairy, processed foods, sugary foods, food dyes, um, you know, sodas. Foods that may help bipolar, broccoli is amazing, red bell pepper, onions, omega-3s. And again, see the pattern here, ultra processed foods, uh, caffeinated beverages, our, our white breads, our alcohol may worsen these symptoms. Foods can improve memory with, you know, with our Alzheimer's patients or people that just struggle with their memory. Caffeine, turmeric, cinnamon, um, black peppers. We're seeing sage. Ginger is amazing. Ginger is absolutely amazing. I it's recommend to my patients they eat a little bit of ginger every day. Foods that may worsen memory. Again, you're seeing the pattern here. 
ultra processed foods, alcohol, our, our, our breads, white breads, foods that may help with schizophrenia. Look at these, all types of tea, green, white, um, and uh, uh, black teas, bell peppers, uh, pomegranates are amazing, walnuts, quinoa, uh, flax seeds, broccoli, foods that can worsen. Again, we're talking about these ultra processed foods, the breads, the high sugar foods, and our alcohol, foods that can help with PTSD, blueberries, one cup a day, absolutely very helpful. And it doesn't cure it, but just think about it. If someone's suffering for this, if it, if it decreases it 10%, that's a huge number. Uh, turmeric, omega-3s, foods that worsen PTSD. Again, you're seeing the pattern here, ultra processed foods um, and sugary foods. So that was a quick walk through that, but I did it because I wanted to come to this point and really sit there and take a breath together and say, that sounds like a big change, but this, I, I can't make those changes. And that's okay. That's okay. People do things for real reasons, but people don't do things for very re real reasons. And if you feel like, oh, those are huge changes that I can't do it, then I think that what we can talk about is how to increase it slowly. Maybe do more of those healthy whole foods and plant-based and high fiber rich foods and do them and increase them and try to get your palate and get your taste buds used to fruits and, and how fruits can help with um, getting you used to eating those instead of the, the added sugars in our foods. So there, the, 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 those are the reason, some of the reasons we may be talking about, but why do we, some people have them I think that if we if we talk about them and we understand them and be empathic and compassionate with each other, then over time we can try to help our loved ones and ourselves get more used to eating more real foods with fiber, feeding our gut microbiota, and therefore helping us not only physically, but also mentally. And I want to share this last slide with you that's really exciting for me. The the Royal you know, we're, I'm working towards getting this done in the United States. I'm working with the American Psychiatric Association, and hopefully by the time you see this, if you're watching it stream later, that it will already be a, a done thing. But I hope to hear within the next few weeks that I'm trying to increase our education in medical schools and residencies to try to help others also learn about the impact of lifestyle changes and how we can have that as part of our curriculum for mental health. The leaders in this space are in Australia and New Zealand, and the clinicians and all the doctors and the people that take care of patients there, their guidelines, if a patient or client comes in with mild or moderate, that means not too severe mood or anxiety disorders, the guidelines in that country is that you need to, if available, provide lifestyle changes information to patients so they can use them first. And then you can talk about psychological inter interventions, meaning psychotherapy or coaching. And then you can, if they want to, and if they need it, provide psychotherapy Pharma, pharmacotherapy, which is medications. And then you go up to the uh, other strategies if they're more severe, if they don't get better. But the exciting part that lifestyle changes are there, hopefully in America, we will also add those on very shortly. So down the road in a few years from now, then when you go to your uh, healthcare provider, they will also be able to talk to you about these lifestyle changes that you just heard about today in this webinar. Thank you so much. Wow, that was that awesome. was awesome. Thank you, really good, <laughs> phenomenal information. I mean, I just I kept telling myself I'm gonna have to watch this again. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I did it fast. But I wanted to get so perfect. much out there. I don't know what else to do. No, it was it was perfect. I really really enjoyed it. I think it was wonderful, and I think that we can start going through some of the questions. We have some very good uh, questions. I'm going to ask the first one first, just because full plate is all about fiber. And I'm curious, um, we would love your recommendations for high fiber foods. And this oh is goodness. from Renee. Yeah. So Amy, she can answer this as well. Amy, you want to start and then I can add? Yes. Why don't you start? <laughs> we're grab our handy dandy full plate here. You know, we're all about filling this part with whole unprocessed fiber foods and really 
it's so cool to see so much of, I mean, even new learnings here of watching yours, I knew I would learn so much more just about the mental health connection of the gut, but just, you know, this is what we even love more about Whole Plate now is those fiber foods that you're filling this part with, this is really is what's feeding that. So fruits, vegetables, beans, uh, cooked whole grains, and then, you know, the 25%, even if you do choose some ultra processed foods or you do choose a beverage, it's being mindful about what you're putting in here so that you're not feeling 75% with ultra processed and those type of things, but really feeding your gut off of this part of the plate. So, um, you know, if you have, if you're just new to full plate, go through your program, it will give you steps that you can start taking today at your very next meal. And I love how Gia said, you know, sometimes there's so many different obstacles and really it's about taking that first step. It's not about overhauling your plate right away, but it's about those small steps. And guess what? Those microbiota, they love it and they will respond. Our bodies are they amazingly made. After one meal, I mean, yeah. they respond immediately. Yeah, so I got to tell you, there's there's another study, and, and I didn't bring this up today, but I just wanted to bring it up really quickly. They took the microbiota from our, our standard American diet, that's like 60, 70% of this ultra processed food, and they put it in these poor unsuspected school, souls in Africa, they knew about it, and they, they did it for, and two weeks later, they found they ended up having depression. And what they did is the, they did the opposite. They took the microbiota from these people that have never had processed food in Africa, and they took that microbiome and they put it in people that had the standard American diet and had depression, and they started feeling better. So there's there's Amazing. such a connection in that what's going on in our microbiome. So just to answer that person's question from my perspective, it's what Amy said, but I really think that we need to, and it's hard in the beginning and people always say, my body's not used to it, it's hard to do. You do it slowly, but you know, you, you add as many things. We don't, 95% of us in this country plus don't get enough fiber in our diet, okay? So you do as much as you can, eat as many fruits as you can, grab those vegetables, cook them. And what I what I challenge most people to do is, you know, and please don't mind if I say this, chicken. If you try if you look at chicken and you eat it without putting anything on it, it tastes horrible. What really tastes good in the chicken is the, the spices you put on it. So take those same exact spices and put it on something that's plant-based. Put it on an apple. I'm, I'm sorry, put it on an eggplant. Put it on a, a sweet potato. Put it on something that's healthy and, and it'll taste just as good and you'll change your app, your, your taste buds and you'll start liking it. So I strongly believe as many things as you can, eat as many legumes as you can. For protein sources, green leafy vegetables are amazing. Nuts are amazing. Non-salted nuts, please. No salt added. The other thing is thank you for showing the diversity, you know, like in a week, I know um, one of the nutritionists we work with, um, she said, you know, even like if you could get 30 different types of plants in a week and that it could even be herbs, you know, um, a gastroenterologist out of Stanford was talking about, you know, even the different herbs that you eat help that. Um, as as long as it's a quarter of a spoon, yeah. it's considered one of those. Yeah. yeah so yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's a game you can play at home. It's like how many, how many different things you can do I, it's actually one of my favorites. And now I challenge myself, even when I go out to eat, I've started eating at these bowl restaurants because you can get like 15 plant, different plant ingredients in one meal. I'm like, that's half of my fiber variety for the week. Yay. Yeah. And you so, know, there's one other thing I wanted to say about that, because I think people, when they talk about, oh, I can't eat it, I can't tolerate it, it upsets my stomach. Well, it's because your poor microbiota have been starving and they're kind of shrunk. So you got to do it in moderation. It's just like this. If you were, if somebody gave you a plan and said, you've been sitting and you haven't been exercising for two years. So then you're not going to go and run a marathon, right? You're not going to go do that because your body can't take it. And it's going to feel like you're allergic to exercising. And it's the same thing with these foods that are really healthy that you have to start slowly and you have to, and, but the ones that you're allergic to that cause you gas or make you feel sick, those are the ones you really need because those, those microbiota are shrunken and they need to slowly start feeding and building up just like your muscles need to build up. Now, a true allergy is different, but then in sensitivity and, and just not having been exposed to that is different. So whatever you do, if you've been eating 100% ultra processed food, do it in moderation so that you can build up your tolerance and in, slew it slowly. It'll be better for you. So you won't give up. I think you can answer a couple of the questions too. Someone says, how long does it take to reverse a poor microbiome? 
Um, and it, so the data's interesting on that. So, you know, what I was telling you about that study of taking that gut from, uh, from what we do in an ultra process and doing it in the African unsuspecting souls. I think, uh, I think I would say that you start feeling better and, and, and feeling better. You can happen soon. Once you go on an unhealthy diet, sometimes it takes a year or two to fully reverse your microbiome because again, they're shrunken. So when you're talking about these microbiome really shrunken, you got to do it over time. So for some people that are really leading unhealthy, I would say do it slowly, hang in there a little bit of time and, and, and until you can actually increase, but do a lot of diversity. And, but if you've been having some healthy foods in your diet, and then you can just keep replenishing your microbiome and increasing them, then over time, sometimes you'll see it in, in a few months, but it does take time. So hang in there. Great. Thank you for the answer. Here's a question about a definition. How are you defining or describing what good mental health is? Oh, what a great question. I'm glad somebody was listening to me. That means they were listening. So I think it's not how I define it. It's how you define it. And I think it's when we, when, when I talk about it with my patients, it's how they feel that they're doing well, that their, their absence of symptoms, whatever symptoms were bothering them, because it's not what's bothering me. It was what's bothering them. So if, if patients come in, say that their symptom that it's bothering them is their anxiety or they're, they're feeling sad or not wanting to go to the gym or not wanting to spend time with their grandkids, that is the good mental health is that your symptoms that you are struggling with are better. Okay. Excellent. So this is a little bit related, but a little bit different as well. If you zoom out and you're engaging with an individual, what would that person be doing and saying that would indicate to you this person is healthy mentally? Oh, great question. So I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I've been doing this for a few years and I think I would have answered it differently 30 years ago, but right now I'm gonna go back to the same sort of idea. Um, I think it's about your functioning and how you feel you're getting what you want out of life, okay? Mm -hmm. Outside of the people that I would have to say, you're not doing well, let me help you take care of yourself, which is a very small percentage of people, everybody else, it's about what they want out of life and what they're getting or not getting and helping be, be, that person be optimal within what they want and how they're feeling mentally. And that's what I would say. Now, of course, if, if, a, if somebody comes to me and they're feeling suicidal or they're hearing voices or seeing things, then I would be saying, let's try to get you to a place where these aren't interfering with your functioning. And that's more about how you function and what you want of your life. You know, it's different for different people in different stages of their lives. So it's, it's about what you want and it's not about what I want as a provider, it's what you need and what you want to do to function well. Wonderful, I want to have you as my provider. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this question pertains to fiber supplements. How do fiber supplements affect mental health? Do they work? Uh, uh, great question. So, you know, Amy, do you have an opinion about that before I answer? You know, fiber supplements can help, but man, you get so much more from eating whole unprocessed foods. You get all the extra added benefits of vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals. You get all of these other things that really do push health forward. Um, so, you know, some people, they need them. If your clinician says you need them, that you should add them, then absolutely um, there is benefits to them, but really it's, filling your plate with them. This is where you really need to push to get more fiber in. Thank you. So the, what I, th thank you. And that's usually what I say, but I just want to add one piece about that for the mental health piece. I think the, the issue around fiber supplements is they're not, so any supplements, they're not FDA regulated. They're not, they're not, they're not controlled. We don't know what's in them or not in them. We don't know if one, one says on the package they're you're getting this many milligrams, if they're actually that many milligrams, it's, it's not as clear. So they're not as regulated. Number one, number two, what really helps in the fiber is its connection with the rest of the nutrients in the food. And, and that's why, you know, one of the hardest things that, that's really hard for me to say to people, and I'm sorry if this is going to offend anybody in the room, please forgive me, but juice is not a health food. So what happens with juice? It started as a health food. You know, oranges are really good for you. But what happens in that processing and that cold pressed juice and what they remove is they remove all the fiber. 
And so what you have is a sugar just going out there by itself and causing these problems that it wouldn't have be a problem if you just ate the whole orange. So I usually recommend to people that are used to eat, drink, eating, drinking juices, just do smoothies instead, keep the fiber in there because that's actually healthier. But in the same, the same way that we want the sugars to be connected to the fiber, which help you do it in the metabolism of the body, we don't want the fiber without all the other nutrients as well. That it may be helpful, as Amy said, but I would rather you eat it in, in the actual food. Great. Here's a question, and it's kind of related since you were just talking about juice, but this one's about smoothies. Is the fiber in the fruits and vegetables in my smoothies compromised by blending them? Ah, uh, great question. Amy, do you have an opinion? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why it's there. It's all together. It's a problem is when you press it and you get rid of the fiber. As long as right. you leave it up there, I have a smoothie every morning. So my yeah. smoothie, and we can all just talk about what we eat. So what, what the, what, I love my smoothie. So my smoothie, I, I have a, I have a touch of ADHD and anxiety. So I've got that blueberries going on every morning. <laughs> I've got my blueberries. I have my flax seeds. I put my kale in there. I throw whatever's in the fridge, whatever's left over. Sometimes it's an apple. Um, I throw a little ginger, turmeric. I like a little spice in my in my food. So I throw sometimes I throw a, a pepper in there, a hot pepper. Um, what do you do? Do you do you eat sm drink smoothies? Eat drink smoothies? Oh Amy? yes, I think uh, Michelle and I both do. And usually our secret ingredient, because we are big full plate fans, is uh, we sneak white beans mm -hmm. into our smoothie. Ah, there you go. Because they cream up so so nice, you don't even know they're there. <laughs> and it's a great way to get more greens in. It's a great way to get veggies yeah. in, especially if you're going to have it at breakfast. You know, it's another way to sneak all those things in. Maybe have it so you yeah. can freeze it and then have a popsicle later. <laughs> Beautiful. Exactly, especially in the summertime. Yeah. yeah. So will the microbiota naturally increase with added fiber in the diet or is it necessary to take probiotics? Beautiful question. So let's let's just stop for a second and define terms. So there's something called prebiotics and probiotics. So probiotics are actually the microbiota in your system. That's what you're taking. You're taking live something live, and the prebiotics are the fiber that the, the microbiota need to 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 to, um, to uh, grow and and be healthy. So if you add fiber again, every every microbiome has something that they need. So there's there's microbiome that per, need eggplant or you know or phytonutrients or, or the herbs. So you just so yes, you eat a diverse number of things. Try to get thirty different. That's the number that we've been talking about in in in, in popular press and the media. Try to do as much as you can, and then it'll help. Now, if you've taken antibiotics or chemotherapeutic agents or you've had a disease where you're just nothing left in your microbiome, then you can you can supplement with probiotics for a period of time. Again, the problem with supplementation is I don't know what you're getting because it says it's a certain amount. I do this website and, and this is, I don't earn any money from this. So I'm not trying to sell anything, but Consumer Labs is a, is a website that I really like that kind of evaluates some probiotics. Um, and then that's the one that I use to, to evaluate my probiotics when I, when patients that have been through cancer treatments or other, you know, just there's nothing left in their gut because they've taken antibiotics. It happens quickly because you, you just, if you just have nothing there, then, you know, it may take a little while for the fiber. Do you have a different opinion, Amy? All right. I'll, I'll let Michelle chime in. I'm answering smooth questions over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we've always said that, you know, just like you said, if you don't have the, the prebiotic, the probiotics there, if you don't have that bacteria there, then you would go ahead and take a probiotic. However, you can take all the probiotics in the world. If you're not feeding them fiber foods, they're just going to shrink up and you're still going to be sick. Yeah. So there's that connection too, that you have to feed, you have to feed, 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 feed what you're importing into your gut. Otherwise it's not going to survive or, or it's not going to give you the benefit of it thriving, which is what, when we're healthy, we're healthy when they're healthy. Exactly. Beautiful. You know, I we learned a lot about um, some different things. If any of you are readers and you want to read a book, Dina, I don't know, Gia, I don't know if you have any um, suggestions on books, but I know one that I read, and I think at least I knew that the first two chapters, I was like, wow, oh my goodness, 
Yes. It was called The Good Gut. Yes. And that was just a fascinating, but I'm going to find the link on Amazon and put it in here. But the good gut, I thought it was just, it answered actually a lot of the different questions that um, some people are asking, but I'll put that one in the chat for, for you all who like to read. And I, G, I don't know if you have any other books that you've read that you would recommend. No, that sounds great. I think that's a good one. I think that the, 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 the discipline is evolving so quickly that every time I recommend a book, it's like, oh, that's kind of a little old. So I think just just attending these webinars and, and, and just uh, keep it, keeping it fresh is book, you know, I don't know. I'm writing a book, so maybe yeah. in a year I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When it comes out. How do you get out of a cycle of eating sugary foods from a mental health side? That's a really important question. So there's a lot of people that are working on this space, uh, you know, and talking about and, and, you know, some people will frame it in a food addiction sort of idea. Like, you know, you just can't eat it. But what I know is from the patients that I've dealt with, it's not a simple answer because it's very individual, right? Some people have some answers and the other. It's a spectrum from once you stop and shut that off in your brain, then you, it becomes less and less and less. And there's some of us that have that addictive gene, you know, just look in your family history and say, okay, everybody's got an addiction to my family. And some of us can then not eat sugar again, because it causes that to rev up. And then we go down the cycle of, of, of eating a lot of sugary foods. There's some of us that don't have that addictive gene. And once you stop doing it, you stop craving it and then it's fine and you can eat it every so often and that's fine you just need to know yourself a little bit but i think the most important thing for me to it, with my patients is eat a lot of fruits fruit mm -hmm. fruits fruits yes. your body your your palate will start appreciating the sweetness in fruits and then then that artificial sugar added foods will not taste good anymore or if they do they taste different and you will get yourself mentally you know adjusted to the food and the sweetness of of real um and, and do as many it, like i don't know what is the most favorite fruit the most sweet fruit that you can think of eat that eat that and eat it often i mean what are we saying you know fill three quarters of your plate with this stuff it's mm -hmm. good for you Exactly. Have room at every meal for a piece of fruit if you want. I will say another thing that does help with cravings for sugary foods is getting enough sleep at night. If you're not getting enough sleep at night, then you are much more susceptible to cravings of junk food, period. So if you're already wanting sugary foods, that's what you're going to want more of. Right. And the other thing is, I mean, if we're getting a little bit more intricate around that is there's a lot of behavioral techniques that I use with my patients and, and, and that really are helpful in replacing. So if this is, if this is your treat and that's what you're doing sugar from, then replace it to some, with something else that you really enjoy. And then give your, give yourself a way to replace it and, and make something else that you enjoy doing. Like if I do repeat this and this is what I get, you know, and then it could just kind of switch it off a little bit and see what you can replace that with. That I know to that. the one o'clock hour, um, or sorry, to central time. I guess it depends where you're at. The one hour mark. Um, I know, and y'all have brought up sleep a couple of times. So just in case we don't get and have detail in that, we actually had a sleep expert come on last year. I think actually June last year. And so I'm going to put in the the um, the chat. I'm going to put a link to the article that she wrote as well as the workshop that she did that can really help make sleep um, better. So check that out if you're still with us here. Yes, that is a very good uh, workshop and she has great tips in there. Yeah. Here's a uh, more specific one to ADHD. Any tips for redirecting diagnosed ADHD children to whole foods away from UPF? Oh, wow. That's a big one. That's a real big one. Um, yes. As a child psychiatrist, that's, that's a big one that comes all the time. And, you know, I gotta, I gotta take a step back from that. Oftentimes, I, I have seen numerous times people diagnosed with ADHD when they actually get back to a whole food plant-based diet, they actually don't look as ADHD as they were before. So I've seen that and I, I started seeing that almost 25 years ago in my practice. So it's, it's, a, it's a thing and it's real. Um, I, I think again, the reward system is really helpful. I think it's modeling as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think if we, we take what we, what we knew and we do it as a family because kids are still really looking at what family you're, what you do, cut those 
fruits and those vegetables into bite size, put, and everybody eat them together. And it, it's all about what you do together that seems to be the best way to do it. I think the, the biggest problem is the packaged stuff. Uh, if you could try to get it, get it out of your home and, and not eat them yourself, because if you continue to eat them, um, it's going to be really hard to not have your kids eat them. Um, I don't know. If, I think individually, I've done a lot of things. I have, I have these snacks at home. Um, I think the other thing about the ADHD kids also is I pair it with movement and exercise. And I think that that also is very helpful because a lot of times all of this is combined together. Um, and then try to get people to start exercising, the kids to start moving as well. And that seems to be helpful. I mean, I, I, I feel for you. I'm glad you're asking the question. Um, and, I, and, I, and I hope that you continue on this path because it's very important for our kids. It's our future. They're our future. Mm -hmm. So true. Here's another one that's more specific to medication. Most medications are toxic on some levels. Do those psycho medications that you speak of affect the microbiome and gut health? Uh, great question. We, I don't know. I don't, there hasn't been research done on that that I'm aware of, um, but I can't believe that it, it doesn't. So I, I believe all medications affect the gut microbiome in some because they're chemicals, right? So I think they do. I, I don't think uh, that there has been some research that I am aware of to date on that, but that's a great area of research. Yes. Thank you for your answer on that. Do you have any recommendations for people with Crohn's who need to limit fiber intake? Ah, oh my goodness, that's a that's a big that's a big topic. Um, I I think it's beyond the scope of me talking about that today because I'm a psychiatrist, so I don't want to put my head in somewhere where I don't belong. But I think that what I would suggest on that is we do have plant based uh, gastroenterologists. And um, maybe um, at, at another that, that that do talk about this quite a bit. I don't want to put my head in that when I don't really want. That's not my area of expertise. But there are plant-based um, physicians that have strong opinions about that. Thank you for your honesty and help and guidance there in the direction to go with. Does the diet the mother keep during pregnancy affect the microbiota for the baby? Absolutely. What a great question. So there's there's some interesting studies on this topic. So we know that as the that as the baby's coming out of the birth canal, that they do get the gut the microbiota in their gut from what the mother has. So what what we know is that when when the babies are born, what I know for now, and it may change, but we're kind of like a clean slate. And then you start getting all this microbiota and it starts getting in there. So it's not actually that the gut microbiota is, is being formed in the, ba in the baby when they're in utero, but it's from when they come out and then what's in the environment. And it, it's interesting because the gut microbiota in family members is more closely linked than it is from the genetics that you know, from if you were adopted, they do adoption studies and they see that. And then they also say that it's more closely linked to roommates. So then you go and you get older and you live with your roommates and it's more closely to what your roommates gut microbiome's like, then, and then it starts deviating away from your family. So we, for what we know right now, that's where you're starting to get your gut microbiota from. Excellent answer. And here's a fascinating question. How can your microbiome be measured? Great question, Mary Beth. So there, there so this is I they usually put this slide. I didn't put it for this presentation, but there are there are uh, companies that are measuring and they're they're commercially looking at gut microbiome. Some of those are a thousand dollars to measure. Some are ninety nine dollars to measure. The problem with those are, that, again, it's still an evolving field, but there are some that have been showing some pretty amazing research and studies that they give you a printout of your diversity of your gut microbiome, some diseases that you could have, what you're missing. They measure your saliva, some of them as well, and they can actually look and see what's going on in your gut what's not happening and give you some ideas of what to do to improve it. So it's there, it's happening. Um, and it's very, it's very interesting. There's some that are really, really um, doing an amazing job with that. So it can be measured. You can Google it and search for it. 
Um, I don't think I should be talking about commercial products in this pro in this podcast. I, I do understand. And I will say that we actually used one of those companies for a family member that was really struggling with issues with their gut. And it took about six months, but the recommendations were right on. Right on. It just like, it was amazing the change, the change that happened. So that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, actually, Amy, and Gia, maybe both of you can answer this one. How do you find a lifestyle provider? Uh, Amy, do you want to do with who, what you recommend first? I have a little bit more uh, expertise in your positions that I know you have. <laughs> <laughs> have it. Sure. So there's there there's a couple of I mean if you don't mind me talking about other other places no no the Plantrition project is probably the best uh, resource that we usually send people so I don't know if you can find it Amy and put it in yeah. the chat for people it's the Plantrition so there's it's actually a, a service where you can look at the state and then they have a list of a lot of um, most of the that's probably the most comprehensive um, play, resource that I know. Um, also, I would say that even if you, uh, uh, American College of Lifestyle Medicine is developing a database, you can go in there and see, like, I'm in that database um, and other people, but I think it's really state by state dependent, and I would go with the Plantrition Project first. A lot of times, Excellent. too, you could even, even um, you know, just do a search. I've done, I've done this for people before that I can't <laughs> find one of those in an area. And sometimes you can search, you know, just for different doctors that might have good web pages in your area that you could kind of, but another thing is always, you know, you're hiring a, a clinician, a physician to work with you, ask questions before you go, um, inter kind of an interview process of, of them to see if, you know, they're like-minded like you. And I mean, the internet is so great for being able to research people, read reviews um, of things like that too. Yeah, and I'm on the, I'm on the board of the Plant Bay, uh, Plant Powered Metro New York. So if you're in New York City, um, that's a great resource. We have a lot of uh, you know it's called Plant Powered Metro New York, um, and I'm on the board of director of that. Uh, and we have a lot of free resources um, and and uh, some advisory board members and our board of directors that may be able to help you find some somebody in the area. And there's so many different, you know, different type of clinicians, whether you're looking for a registered dietitian, you're looking for a psychiatrist, you're looking for a primary care doctor, you're looking for a gastroenterologist, um, you know, and there are, you know, different things trying to be done to help people get um, certifications or just to have that, that knowledge one, but then also to help you finding them. So I think it's fairly, I'll say fairly new, um, what, five-ish or more years? Um, so there's not really a phenomenal database, I'd say, of that yet, which we would love to have that. <laughs> yes. I know when I was looking for my doctor last year, putting in prevention versus just treating general diseases helped me find a fantastic doctor. He's actually pretty much straight out of... Um, just starting to practice and he's wonderful he's very open to lifestyle modifications and lifestyle medicine and that was very helpful as well so prevention might be another good search word as well and kind of like um gia like you were saying you know and trying to work with um the you know the people getting educated with that you know and trying to work it into the system so that all of the new clinicians that are coming out um, I know that's something that the Ardmore Institute of Health has, has done, our foundation organization has done, and really trying to have more of that prevention, more of the you know, nutrition, act, physical activity. I mean, most doctors have one semester of nutrition, and that's about as much as I've had. You know, so. <laughs> All right. Right. One semester, 19 hours is the data. Yeah. You know, 19 hours is right. it's like first, it, and, and, and the, even those 19 hours, Amy, when you look at it, it's more about how do you treat uh, calcium deficiency if you've given an IV? That's a nutritional class. So that's not even about prevention right. or, you know, treating. So we're so glad that we can provide, you know, um, resources and helping, uh, you know, get our, our country more behind prevention and have those talks early in life with people so that hopefully we can prevent some different things and help pe put people on a healthier path earlier in life. Yeah. Yes, I, it's one of our passions and we're so excited to be a part of it. 
I'm going to go ahead and pull up the last question. While I do that, Amy, do you mind sharing in the chat the link to where somebody can purchase the plate, oh. the 75% plate? I'll oh, happy to hunt that up. <laughs> so I realized that I'm going to guess, Dr. Merlo, that you don't have these off of the top of your head. <laughs> Are there studies um, or study titles that you can point to that discuss the issue with having dairy milk? So maybe if you don't have anything off the top of your head, where would you recommend somebody go and find that information? How could they find it? That's a great question. So, um, so I, I think the, the, the issue with dairy is that it's inflammatory. Okay. It causes the, it, dairy is a lot there's a, the FDA and and they, and what they do is they regulate the amount of pus cells that are allowed to be in milk. So we know they're pus cells and milk pus is just inflamed it's, it's it's bacteria and it's it's junk, right? It's a pus that you do from your your so we know that. So we know it's inflammatory. Um so I think the answer to that question is there's a whole bunch of studies, but we have a big lobby in the dairy industry, so they don't come out and it's hard to find them. I think that if you go to, I don't know if you have any on your website, Amy, but I know if you go to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, there it was a tab, but they're updating their, um, right now they're updating the website that has research on there that shows it. Um, I will be glad to, um, send it to somebody if you want to, you know, I, I don't know what else to say, but I think that that's helpful. I think again, if you go to Plant Powered Metro New York, where I know that website really well, we have those studies there as well. We have those research okay. studies there. I, I think if you go to any plant-based, um, so, but there's, there's a lot of compelling data around it, um, what it does in your body. I wish I could tell you the studies right off the bat. I know that I wrote um, in the Hill, I wrote an article uh last year that was published that had some of the citations for that um i don't know if that's helpful there's a jama article that i wrote recently um that uh that just came out in jama that has um that has some information on that as well uh the, one of the citations is there so if you just google my name and do jama plant uh a planetary and personal health that article has 12 citations. One of them is on dairy. So that's the best I can tell you if you want something right away. And it, it, it made it into JAMA, which is the Journal of American Medical Association, which is a very reputable journal. So I think right. that would be the way to do it. I, and I will pull that up um, so and link it so people can actually read it if they want to. Thanks for sharing that, Dia. I also... Um, added in a couple of other additional um, links before we get off here. One is we did have a PhD nutritionist talk on the gut microbiome and the diversity of some different foods. So if you, um, that could also be something if you want to dig into it a little bit more. Um, and I did put the, the website for the plate. <laughs> we don't make any money off of them, but unfortunately they're quite expensive oh. when you print them one by one. So <laughs> we don't keep them in stock, but they are fun for talking. <laughs> Yes, they're oh, great. I'm buy one. <laughs> so uh, that is all of the questions that we had marked. I know one just came in. If you do want to answer one more, is there a correlation between gut health, anxiety, and low iron levels? I don't know the answer to that question. That yeah. We don't know the answer to That's that. That's very specific. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you so much for what way you presented. I actually wanted to read when it was marked as a question, but it's not a question. I think there's a lot more questions um, that have come in. It's just the time. Yeah. Right, right. So this is from Cynthia Hurd. I'm actually going to answer it live so that you can read it. That was awesome. Thank you so much. I work in population health and I'm excited to start making recommendations to my clients in Philadelphia based on this model information. Thank you. Much gratitude. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you for helping us as end users, but also for anybody that is a clinician that got to participate in today's workshop. We're so glad for every person that was here, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, thank everyone. you very much.